Okie dokie. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. If you think that you're here for a live-in event, you are definitely in the right place. Uh, so tonight we have Bonnie Lashowitz and Shaminder Singh. We're going to be presenting with us and we are going to be listening to a presentation on men's mental health, uh, interrupting our busyness. Uh, so the Libin Institute is here in Calgary and uh, we are connecting cardiovascular yeah. research yeah. and clinical care. Um, so that is our goal. Um, and to meet that, we have a bunch of different initiatives that we uh, work on. Uh, so I am part of the CVME, so the Women's Cardiovascular Health Initiative. And there are a couple other ones. We have a data initiative, the Stevenson Cardiac Imaging Center, and also a person to population initiative, which focuses more on epidemiological research. Uh, so I uh, also want to take a moment just to recognize um, at the University of Calgary, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people in Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Um, for a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, um, obviously don't feel pressured to enable your camera. So I know a, a lot of us have a little bit of Zoom fatigue at this point. Um, feel free to share so we can interact. Um, and especially during Shaminder's uh, session, my guess is he's gonna ask us to turn on our cameras so we can interact a little bit more. Um, but also please be mindful of your privacy when asking questions or sharing personal details. Um, the first part of this recording, or the, the first part of this presentation will be recorded. Um, the second part with Shaminder, we're gonna turn recording off so that um, don't worry about that portion. Um, but if you have a question that you would like to ask and you don't feel like asking it out loud or in the chat, feel free to direct message me on the chat function and I will at, um, ask the question for you. Um, also, just to note, to participate in the breathing exercises, you will have needed to complete a waiver and I will pop the um, link for that into the chat in case there's anybody who needs to finish that last minute. Also, uh, we love uh, hearing from you on our social media. Um, so you can tag your posts with Live in Moves or follow us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, or Instagram. Uh, whatever is your favorite social media platform, we're there. All right, so like I said, our presenters today are Dr. Bonnie Lashwitz and Dr. Shaminder Singh. So Dr. Lashwitz is an associate professor at U, U Calgary's Cummings School of Medicine. So she's in the Department of Community Health Sciences, Community Rehabilitation and Disability Studies Specialization. Um, so she leads a program of qualitative and mixed methods research about responsibilities and identities in relation to an array of disability, mental health disorder, and chronic disorder diagnoses. Um, so her program is built on the concepts such as resilience, busyness, and moral distress. So we're very, very excited to welcome Dr. Lashwitz to talk to us today. And then later on, we're gonna hear from Dr. Singh. So he is a postdoctoral researcher um, with Dr. Huda Kwan's health promotion research team. So he's in the Department of Community Health Sciences, also at the Cummings School of Medicine. So he has professional training in health research, nursing, yoga, and psychology. Um, so for his doctoral research, Dr. Singh developed a grounded theory to reveal how South Asian older men manage their hypertension in a Canadian context. Um, he's also developing a lifestyle modification program uh, to help those with hypertension uh, self-manage their um, symptoms uh, as well. Um, so that's based sort of in the, the community of Calgary. Uh, so thank you so much to Dr. Lashowitz and Dr. Singh for joining us today. And Dr. Lashowitz, feel free to share your slides and take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you very much um, for all of that. And uh, just wanting to underline the territorial acknowledgement, particularly in relation to uh, yesterday having been our National uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. So I think we've got some um, added impetus to give pause and um, think about our, uh, our, our relationship with the land and the people who came before us. Um, can I just do a quick sort of sound check? Are my, is my cover slide visible here? Is my 
my voice audible? That's okay. We're clear to proceed. Okay. Okay, and uh, so um, thank you very much for taking time out of your uh, early summer um, to uh, join with us today. Really excited to um, uh, talk about the learnings and experiences in the research milieu and take that out uh, to broader audiences. Um, so really happy to be with you here today. Um, please bear with me. I'm going to flip around uh, and show a quick video in a couple of slides. It's just a three minute video, but it's going to uh, involve some clunkiness of uh, sharing screen, dropping screen share, and so on. So if you'll uh, just go along with that, um, I'd be really appreciative. So I titled this talk, um, Interrupting Our Busyness Program. And as uh, Lauren indicated, I come from a critical disability studies background. And so we're endlessly interested in how the world tends to be designed very well for some people and uh, designed in ways that can create obstructions and marginalizations for other people. Um, certainly uh, people with uh, mental health struggles, people with um, um, uh, developmental or acquired disabilities, uh, people of advanced age, uh, people um, of low socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera. And so that is the overall um, <clears throat> sort of uh, interest that I have is in thinking about uh, how our ways of being have implications for people um, who have some social and structural disadvantages. So busyness gives me a way to access that. Um, and uh, it's a way of situating work in uh, the contemporary sort of practices in which we are all immersed. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I think often of um, the American philosopher Thomas James' um, uh, expression that, you know, truth is something that happens to an idea. And so it's not that busyness is good or bad or, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, inherently, but rather um, busyness has come to be um, an exceedingly valued social um, way of being in our, in our milieu. So I just want to trace a little bit back uh, to some of the origins and um, thinking about busyness. And one of my key ways that I do that is I have a program of research, as Lauren indicated, that um, cuts across a number of areas. One of the big streams of work that I'm undertaking is about um, occupational mental health and um, workplaces as being, you know, uh, so definitive to our uh, life experiences, so influential, uh, both in giving us, um, uh, you know, opportunities and uh, senses of accomplishment and identity, but also in restricting and constraining and straining and stressing us. And so much of what I draw from this evening will be rooted in the studies I have underway about how people navigate um, their workplaces in terms of uh, uh, staying mentally healthy. And uh, I think workplaces are um, uh, a sort of a microcosm of uh, our broader societies. And so I want to talk about the interface between that. Um, but I just want to uh, open by saying I'm here at a men's mental health event because I've really really used uh, sex and gender uh, a great deal in terms of uh, organizing the way that I frame my work, the way that I um, background the, uh, the projects I do and the papers that I write. And so I say sex and gender, and I could say, you know, sexual orientation, I could say race, I could say, you know, socioeconomic status or age, you know, there are a whole host of uh, features and um, characteristics by which we could think about people. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the realm of gender, though, and um, uh, because it's so universal, it's so um, uh, pervasive in terms of our expectations for um, who does what and uh, what is a valued way of uh, fulfilling our roles. So um, that uh, has uh, skewed me uh, to think a lot about the different experiences that men and women have in the workplace and in our broader society. 
anxiety. And uh, it gives me a kind of jumping off point so that I can proceed to um, uh, uh, tackle other topics such as race and um, socioeconomic status and uh, sexual orientation and so on. Um, but let's go with gender now, um, because there are some just incredibly uh, important sort of elements of gender that shape um, uh, virtually every step that we take. So what do we know about sex and gender and mental health? Well, um, we know that uh, men, perhaps because um, they tend to be more impulsive or more um, bold, uh, dramatic in their action, we know that far more men die by suicide compared with women, um, that uh, when men attempt suicide, it um, uh, 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 tends to actually occur. Um, we know that uh, men are less likely than women to report uh, experiences of anxiety and depression. And um, what, what I want to invite you to think about in relation to both of those uh, first two points is just how much of that might be um, inherent, you know, in some bio, uh, physiological, psychological ways, and um, what parts of that might be socially conditioned. Uh, and tethering back to the idea about truth happening to an idea, and, you know, uh, I'm inviting people to think about the ways in which our culture does not give permission to men to um, show weakness, to talk, to expose themselves, to seem vulnerable. And uh, just a couple little bits um, that I've encountered from the research literatures about occupational health is um, uh, findings that men feel uh, pressure within their workplace to um, uh, appear uh, in conventional masculine ways. Um, I, I have um, a study uh, in my literature review where um, men spoke about exposing themselves as experiencing depression and they uh, noted it as a they, what they called a shamed masculine self. Um, so I mean, for lots of years now, since the second wave of feminism in the 1960s, we've been, you know, thinking about the ways that women have been structurally and socially disadvantaged and, you know, fighting for um, equal pay and equal um, opportunities and, and all of those things. Um, I think sometimes when we uh, get behind women's issues, we can forget that any narrow definition of gender and sex um, can, uh, can, can be stressful and oppressive to both sexes. And so just uh, uh, I think tonight is an opportunity to think about the stress and um, restrictions that men carry in accordance with um, gender expectations. Okay. Here comes a little clunky part. We're gonna stop sharing and um, just flip over and show you this three minute video that I think um, says what I'm saying here in a far more elegant way that, uh, than I can manage. Um, clunkiness mode engaged. Uh, and just give that uh, one quick few more moments to load. Lauren, can you see this now? Can you see the video? No, so it's still on your slides. So I think you're gonna have to unshare. Stop crying, stop in tears. Don't cry. Okay. okay. How about now? Yep, you got it. Okay. So far, stop with the emotion. Don't be a pussy. No, no. Can you hear? Yep. Okay, thank you. Nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mind. Nobody likes a tattletale. Bros come before hoes. Don't let your woman run your you life. You bitch. What a fag. Get laid. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. The three most destructive words that every man receives when he's a boy is when he's told to be a man. 
We've constructed an idea of masculinity in the United States that doesn't give young boys a way to feel secure in their masculinity. So we make them go prove it all the time. Within their peer group culture, each of them is posturing based on how the other boys are posturing. And what they end up missing is what they each really want, which is just that closeness. In good times, guys are like really close to each other. When things get a little bit worse, you're on your own. From middle school, I had four really close friends. Once I kind of went into high school, I struggle finding people I can talk to because I feel like I'm not supposed to get help. Our kids get up every morning. They have to prepare their mask for how they're going to walk to school. A lot of our students don't know how to take the mask off. What is it you don't let people see? Almost 90% of you have pain and anger on the back of that paper. If you never cry, then you have all these feelings stuffed up inside of you, and then you can't get them out. They really buy into the, a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. If we're in a culture that doesn't value caring, doesn't value relationships, doesn't value empathy, you are going to have boys and girls, men and women, go crazy. I had anger issues in high school. I felt like an outcast. I've been suspended at least once every year I was here. We would just look for trouble and just like try to fight. Boys are more likely to act out. They're more likely to become aggressive. Most people miss that as depression or see it as a conduct disorder or just a bad kid. I felt like just giving up on life. You know, I actually had suicide thoughts in my head at sixth grade. I felt alone for, for a long time. And I actually thought about killing myself. Whether it's homicidal violence or suicidal violence, people resort to such desperate behavior only when they are feeling shamed and humiliated or feel they would be if they didn't prove that they were real men. If you're told from day one, don't let nobody disrespect you, and this is the way you handle it as a man, respect is linked to violence. If I can man up, why step down from that, you feel me? It's like instinct. Kids, I was gonna end this hyper masculine narrative here. And so, um, uh, happy to chat further about that one. One misconception of meditation is that if you're meditating, your mind will be blank. You can't make your mind blank. And if you try, you're just going to wind up with a gigantic headache. <laughs> In a way, when we're on autopilot, we're sleepwalking through our lives. Sorry, I just got to get out of a few Mindfulness screens. Mindfulness is traditionally a form of meditation. It's the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present. We got a little clip there about some other um, uh, uh, videos that we might want to check out, right? So um, there's a little bit of excitement. Okay, so, um, you know, coincidentally, uh, this uh, title of this Mask You Live In project was conceived of well before we were actually wearing masks everywhere we went in our day-to-day -day life. So, um, you know, just thinking about uh, the, the poignancy of um, uh, the idea of our presenting self and the way um, we feel compelled to turn ourselves out into the world uh, uh, in uh, ways that will be respected and valued. Um, I just want to show a couple more um, uh, resources. And what I'm hoping by uh, uh, bringing these into our talk tonight, even uh, in, you know, a limited time frame, is to just, in case you are not familiar with these directors and authors, is to acquaint you with some of the extraordinary resources that are um, available. Um, perhaps these might find their ways into your home. Perhaps they might find your, their ways into your um, professional activities or uh, in your um, uh, occupational health and 
safety kinds of activities at work. So um, you may know that Jackson Katz has a very well-developed track record in terms of uh, thinking about correlations between expectations for masculinity and uh, negative consequences of that. Um, violent outcomes as were touched on in the mask you live in clip that we watched. Um, so Jackson Katz has a, a video series. He's got an initial Tough Guys, and then he's got a second one called Tough Guys 2 um, that was created in 2013. Um, he's still uh, uh, very much immersed in this topic and actually uh, just in 2020 produced a new video called The Man Card. And uh, here he's doing, a, a adding into you know all of his previous work, layering it on with with um, the ways in which the leadership, the formal leadership um, is influential in terms of what we expect from ourselves and um, each other. Um, so please, you know, avail yourselves of those if um, that hits the mark in any way. Um, thinking about some of the um, subtle sort of uh, uh, messaging that exists in our culture. And so I titled this slide, um, you know, just thinking about early life in uh, understandings of the workings of gender and thinking about, you know, what are we um, putting into the minds of our children? What are we feeding into the minds of our children? And um, you'll see uh, what I did here is just a quick grab from Google Images, but the search term was Father's Day cards. And um, notably, uh, a great many of the images that appear uh, in terms of uh, desirable cards to provide, uh, to give to, for children to give to their dads, um, they feature uh, um, uh, very white collar work. And so I'm thinking about um, the kinds of uh, rugged masculinity that you just saw profiled in the mask that you live in, that real tough guy um, kind of image. Image. Correspondingly, um, there continues to be an extraordinary expectation on men in our culture to be good providers and, um, uh, you know, to have um, uh, uh, financial resources uh, with which to support others. And I invite you to think critically about what you see on the shops of the card stores, assuming, you know, that you're still giving um, uh, uh, cards that you send in the mail or that are in hard copy. Um, but think about the cards in the card store. Think about um, just all of the imagery surrounding that and all of the online resources we have for recognizing men. And uh, just pay, give a critical eye to how much profiling there is of men with suits and ties and um, computer uh, uh, types of equipment. And, um, you know, much less so uh, do we see images of men with hard hats or work boots or, uh, you know, just men spending time with their children um, is not a very common image. So this subtle and yet pervasive sort of expectation um, that men be providers uh, is evident in, uh, in uh, uh, certainly the, the the messaging and, if you will, programming uh, to, of children in terms of Father's Day. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, alternatively on the Father's Day cards, you'll often see um, uh, profiling of dad in his leisure activities. And many of those cards um, tend to be uh, uh, representations of sports like golfing or fishing. And, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, think about the ways that the kind of leisure activities that are profiled on those Father's Day cards are um, the activities of affluent men. And so we can trace that back to that persistent expectation that men um, earn uh, a considerable income. Um, just, you know, relating that to some of the origins of the kinds of uh, circles in which men have moved. We know things, we know that uh, uh, women who lose their husbands versus men who lose their wives, we know that men have uh, a tougher struggle with losing their wives. And um, because most of men's relationships are in their immediate home or are 
are related to their work or to their um, activities. Uh, men's social connectedness does not tend to be connections within their own right. Um, men tend to have friends from work and uh, friends from sport activities. And uh, rather than uh, friends that, uh, you know, they're, they're just moving through the life course with and sharing what's in their heart and mind. Um, how does this uh, get taken up in our day-to-day -day activities? Here's where my concept of busyness um, is uh, uh, really comes into sharp focus. Um, we as a culture have this infatuation, this dedication um, to uh, busyness, uh, busy schedules, to being scarce, to being uh, in demand, and all of that has um, very much uh, been equated with being a valued citizen, having um, what uh, the French philosopher Bourdieu says is um, embodied capital. You're very valuable because everybody wants a piece of your time um, so continuously. And thinking about um, some of the trappings of being so busy and scarce and in demand. Um, there's a body of literature uh, in, uh, in uh, gender studies um, that uses the concept concept of conspicuous consumption. And these are the things that we um, uh, adorn ourselves with to show the world just how busy and important we are. And granted, you know, people do that in any number of ways with their clothing and their automobiles and so on. Um, but it's a relatively modern invention that we have signifiers of busyness. And um, these are the people walking through the grocery store talking on their headset because they can't just grocery shop, they have to be um, managing um, uh, their work at the same time. Um, these are um, uh, these kinds of um, messages and um, this value, uh, this dedication of busyness is evident in men who are kind of famous for their busyness. For example, Mark Zuckerberg, um, you know, he's on record as saying that uh, he just does not have time to think about wardrobe. And consequently, um, he wears gray t-shirts and gray sweatshirts uh, virtually everywhere he goes. And so thinking about, um, you know, just uh, what a manifestation of his privilege and his power is embodied in that trademark gray t-shirt that he can wear that in front of his, um, you know, board of directors or his um, stakeholder group or when he's doing um, public addresses. So the, the, the adornments um, that we carry through our lives um, and uh, use to see signify our status um, are very much resonant with um, busyness. I got the red sneakers on that previous slide. There's a whole study called the red sneaker effect. And this is about um, men who um, have a good deal of privilege and power, and uh, uh, they can afford in that conspicuous consumption way to uh, show the world that, you know, in some ways, there are these hard um, driving, you know, very dedicated, very successful, very powerful men, but they still know how to have fun by wearing their red sneakers with their um, uh, uh, business suits. And so just thinking about um, the uh, imaging that we are projecting out into the world and uh, the very careful, um, I mean, those sneakers and that headset and that gray t-shirt, it's just another bunch of masks um, that these men are wearing. And uh, uh, but these ones are dedicated not at projecting toughness and stoicism, but rather uh, aimed at projecting being scarce and in demand and incredibly important. Yeah. Okay, um, thinking about how in our times, um, you know, we're living in an era where we are more surveilled than ever. Um, we're keeping track of everything. We're keeping track of our steps and our heart rate. Um, our employers have ways of keeping track of, uh, you know, the work and the um, reporting uh, that we're uh, engaged in. So we're just um, so continuously monitored. Um, I thought there's a very interesting study by uh, on the screen here from Dara and colleagues back in 2007, where um, this study was about family life. And one of the key findings was that um, not just at work, but also in the rest of our lives, people very much pride themselves on being busy. And um, Dara and colleagues found that uh, for families, it wasn't even specifically about 
what the family was doing or what the children were involved in. But the bigger, more important thing was that the schedule was tight and that the um, calendar on the fridge was full and that, uh, you know, everything was um, just tightly, tightly scheduled and, um, and, and very full. Um, so just critically reflecting on how did we get here um, how did we um, uh, just come to uh, just swallow this just embrace this that the rightful state of um, being a human being is to be so scheduled and so busy and what does the pressure that that um, is rooted in and the pressure that that entails in um, its very processing what does that do in terms of our ability to um, collect ourselves and take take care of ourselves and take time for ourselves and uh, think about our, our, our mental well-being. Um, and, you know, we only have to go back uh, to Victorian eras to um, think about a time when it was very prestigious to have um, leisure time. And we only have to go back to, um, you know, the early eras of kind of the technology explosion in the 80s, where people were anticipating that um, uh, with the technological advancement, we are going to find ourselves with all sorts of leftover time and we're going to be, you know, working four days a week and we're, you know, going to have shorter days and more vacation and all sorts of stuff like that. And instead, um, we just continue to chase after the technology that delivers more information, more data to be consumed and sorted and processed more immediately and more constantly. And so that's my key message is um, to step back from that and to um, realize that this is a socially constructed way of being and that we often have a good deal more power with Within that, then sometimes um, we uh, uh, feel as if we have, we get swept up in the energy, uh, but just, you know, a, an invitation to kind of back up from that. Then I just wanted to finish with a couple of slides before we have a uh, chance for questions. Um, I wanted to finish with a couple of slides that are about recommendations. And again, going back to um, the fact that much of this work is rooted in what is going on in the workplace. Um, these are recommendations for how we manage our work and how our employers um, support us to manage our work. And so I keep pushing um, ideas that um, you know, uh, any of the uh, uh, immersion and onboarding of employees and the, um, you know, professional development of employees, we need a lot more focus in there on uh, taking time for mental health and uh, availing ourselves of resources for mental health and um, uh, for work-life balance. Um, so uh, orientation of employees is a really good um, opportunity for that to uh, get established as the way it is and then for that to be um, followed through in our work. Um, related to that, uh, I have now got um, interviews and survey data from um, I'm going to say hundreds. Yeah, it's approaching hundreds from hundreds of people who are um, employed. And uh, a key theme that we find again and again is that the workplaces um, talk about work-life balance and self-care and mental health, um, but there's no actual enactment. And uh, notably, it's not enacted and modeled from uh, the supervisory levels within the organizations. So um, that old adage of, you know, it's easy to talk the talk, but are you walking the talk? Um, that's what the employees repeatedly tell us is that they need to be in organizations where it's actually followed through rather than um, just spoken about. Um, other um, kinds of uh, ideas, um, I have a number of participants in my data set who talk about um, mental health issues being treated as if they're non-existent, as if they're, um, uh, uh, you know, fabricated in some way, as if they're just not as legitimate as physical health issues. And um, so, uh, you know, just um, whatever each of us can do as individuals or as leaders, as role models, um, to take seriously mental health experiences and um, uh, as a uh, uh, move in the right 
direction. Um, and then my recommendations for employers is always to offer um, sick days or, um, uh, you know, uh, leave days, um, personal days, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that allow people to check in with themselves and to take care of their mental health. Um, almost done here, uh, a key theme that comes to us again and again is the value of flexibility um, in uh, uh, balancing, managing life and work. Um, and so uh, just thinking about uh, potential options that might be uh, supportive of flexible work, flexible scheduling. That said, you know, it's going to be so interesting and I'm hoping to be part of the new literatures that come out of the COVID um, pandemic era um, because, uh, you know, there's uh, consideration now about am I working at home or am I living in my office, you know, for the people who are um, uh, able to work at home and how uh, we've been talking for decades about offices without walls and back to that idea about how technology just delivers data to us constantly. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the pandemic time is, you know, um, uh, amplified and magnified those realities as we're striving to, to um, keep up with everything from, from our homes. And so that blurring of home and, 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 and work. Um, so thinking about ways um, that, uh, you know, that kind of balance and flexibility can be infused uh, into uh, places of employment and certainly into um, uh, employees' day-to-day -day rhythms uh, in order that people feel uh, empowered to take care of their of their mental health. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, creating a workplace context where people feel comfortable um, talking about uh, mental health issues that it's just, you know, the, the, the same way we talk about how our, um, uh, you know, quarterly report looks in terms of our productivity and profits or, or what have you. In my case, in terms of the number of students you teach or the number of research grants you get, um, how's everyone's mental health, you know, um, what kind of status are we, uh, 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 status check do we have as a you know as a group and as a collective and as a, a place of employment um, and then I just wanted to show you a few things I'm happy to share the slides um, afterwards uh, that uh, Lauren can put on the website there are a lot of um, mental health resources available that's the happy part of our um, you know uptake of all of the technological developments is that um, uh, you know many resources are being created that make it easier than ever to just um, go and uh, find resources, do self screenings, um, uh, you know, get pointed uh, in uh, directions to avail yourself of things that would be helpful. Um, so I think uh, that is about what I wanted to share with you. I'm a couple minutes over time because of that, you know, screen sharing mask. My apologies. Um, but, uh, uh, and I hope I wasn't speed talking too badly because I was mindful that, you know, we had a lot to cover. Um, but thank you very much for uh, hearing about that. And um, yeah, happy to hear your comments and questions. Thank you so much, Bonnie. That was fantastic. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to, um, if you know how to use the raise hand function, you can do that. Or just pop on camera and ask your question. Or if you'd rather not ask it um, with your name or whatever attached to it, feel free to message me in the chat and I can ask the question for you. Um, so to get us started, I actually kind of wanted to ask a little bit if the concept of presenteeism ever came up within your uh, research and kind of it, some of the gendered pieces behind that. Constantly. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, for um, just a quick uh, sort of definition, presenteeism is about being present, but not really being present because, um, you know, you're so preoccupied or stressed or um, uh, unwell. Um, and uh, there are some interesting things about um, the difference in gender and the ways that women tend to um, be uh, uh, experience presenteeism. And it tends to be a pull because 
because they are feeling anxious and guilty about aspects of their family um, that they believe are not being well attended to because they're so, um, you know, uh, so, so stretched and so busy. Um, and so that's uh, kind of one more thing to say when we think about gender and mental health and work is that women tend to um, uh, indicate that their uh, work conflicts with their family. Men um, have a similar sort of tension at that interface, but they will speak more in terms of their family as um, encroaching on their work. And so there we get back to some of those, you know, very conventional kinds of uh, gender definitions, where uh, simultaneously our expectations for men to be um, just, you know, upstanding and outstanding employees are um, so pronounced, and comparably our expectations for women to be wonder mom and to, you know, just be um, so um, uh, intensively responsible for and attentive to family. Um, so that family work um, sort of tension um, is uh, uh, um, implicated in a lot of the reports of presenteeism. Um, aside from that, though, presenteeism comes up a great deal when, um, again, um, the point on one of the slides, people just feeling that they don't have permission to, you know, put things down or to, um, you know, report uh, that they're struggling and uh, need some time for themselves. And I mean, all of the um, health economists have done all sorts of projections about how much productivity is lost in any given year. And, you know, it's it's massive numbers um, owing to presenteeism. Yeah, Oh, definitely. Uh, so a few questions are coming in through my direct messages. Um, so would you pr mind presenting a few examples of what a good work life balance might be conceptualized as so um, this person says that they often feel like they're doing nothing when falling behind and um, to put this in context they're a student so how can a person reconcile those feelings with obviously the the push and pull of needing to get things done but also take care of yourself and um, so a couple things um, uh, I wanted to say that that is amped up in our pandemic times where, um, you know, people are uh, needing to self isolate or needing to, um, you know, uh, be a way to recover or, um, you know, etc. Be a way to care for family members because there's no daycare or there's no, you know, schools out, they got a homeschool, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And so there's a whole wave of stress um, being expressed and being um, expressed in an amplified manner during the pandemic um, about, uh, you know, just feeling that they're leaving other people in the lurch if they are um, away for any reason whatsoever, um, including taking care of themselves. Um, a, a model for work-life balance, I think there's, um, you know, uh, the I mean, the best models are contoured according to the individual and your priorities and your preferences. Um, but I think there's something really profound about the idea that, um, you know, if we're not doing self care and balancing ourselves, um, our effectiveness um, in terms of the contributions that we're making through our studies or through our work will be compromised and um, often severely compromised. And so thinking about this, um, uh, you know, it's it's easy to feel guilty or it's easy to feel selfish, you know, but actually maybe a, uh, the, the right way to think about it is um, yeah, playing the long game and trying to preserve ourselves, preserve uh, uh, and restore our effectiveness um, so that ultimately we can uh, can offer the most that we can offer if we're coming from a position of strength. Um, it's interesting that you say that too as a student because I'm having these conversations with my research team now. They're, they're all students and you know the summer is the time when you know well like we really double down and get all, you know so much writing and so much research done because there's no classes you know um, no regular term courses running. Um, and and uh, we are talking just about finding your own formula so that, um, you know, you take a chunk of time or you take many small chunks of time and, and uh, you know, just, um, uh, just the importance of breaks in whatever ways and shapes and forms that can take. Um, the importance of um, having things that round you out so that you feel mastery and competence and identity and elements that are not related 
related to your work. I think that's um, really important. Oh my goodness, this is a whole other lecture. I need to, you know, come back for a follow up. But I hope that that um, uh, just gives you know kind of a few sort of starting ideas. Um, I think that though, um, just holding on to that kind of common sense bottom line that um, if we're not in a position of strength, our contributions are going to be less strong, and we want our contributions to be as strong as they can. So um, yeah, just um, uh, finding that formula. And one last question, and this one seems to kind of trail off of that. Um, so as somebody with a chronic condition, I often feel like there is no line between mental health and physical health. Um, I wish more people just kind of openly discussed that. Um, so I know in your slides, you kind of chatted about them separately, but for a lot of people, obviously there is a bi-directional relationship. And one of the things we talk about a lot in, you know, living uh, is the relationship between mental health and cardiovascular disease. So, um, I mean, feeds kind of into my own research, but um, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Um, back to the um, William James idea about truth happening to an idea. Um, all of this, and I'm sure Shaminder is going to say some far more inspired things than I'm about to say right now, but um, all of the ways that we define ourselves, you know, um, in terms of our um, uh, heart and our soul and our mind and our body and our, you know, spirit and our et cetera, et cetera. There's a certain arbitrary contrariness to that. And um, I think for inspiration, we can look to um, some of the holistic health practitioners who are, you know, really quick to say, look, you know, um, you can't, um, like anything is only as strong as the weakest link. And how can we, you know, in with with any kind of logic separate uh, our mental state of being from our physical state of being. Um, one of my favorite books is um, uh, by a Dutch author, and it's about um, the body keeps the score. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna quickly say this and then I'll stop because I could talk about this book forever. But um, what it is, is a, it's about the deep and sort of um, uh, early um, uh, uh, architecture in our, in our very being and how we carry every single facet of experience that we've had. We carry that with us in conscious and unconscious ways, but it is residing somewhere in the intelligence of the body and um, that it's really impossible to, you know, feel well in one, you know, area and, and unwell in another area. And um, so that kind of um, uh, totality, that integrated um, self, um, yeah, I, I, I think that's um, such an excellent point. Um, you make me want to ally with um, my uh, colleague in uh, philosophy and, and uh, you know, just kind of take this on, you know, about this... Um, we would have to, you know, scorch the earth and break down all of our institutions of, you know, how we've defined health. Um, but yeah, it's quite ridiculous, really. Like if we step back far enough from the way that humanity has organized itself, um, we can see that there's so much absurdity in there. And uh, yeah, um, that I think um, that the uh, intimate and intricately intertwined nature of mind and body is um, is is really um, uh, uh, you know profound and uh, we've just gone about organizing the world to separate those things and um, yeah there's there's a lot of flaws with that um, logic of separation all right thanks so much Bonnie that was absolutely fantastic um, and if anybody has any more questions, um, feel free either to just message Bonnie directly. Um, I'll make sure everybody has access to her email address um, when I send out a, uh, the email with all the resources that Bonnie had um, added to her talk. Um, so thanks again. Um, I'm going to stop recording and we're gonna turn over the, I would say floor, but it's more like turn over your screen to Shaminder. <laughs> <laughs>